All right. Hello and welcome to episode one of Tasting Notes, a conversation inspired by music and good taste, presented by the Bangor Symphony Orchestra and the Bangor Wine and Cheese Company. My name is Brian Hinrichs. I'm the executive director of the Bangor Symphony, and I am joined by Lucas Richmond, the BSO's music director and conductor, uh, Eric Meehan, owner of Bangor Wine and Cheese Company, and a very special guest, Andre Houston Mack, winemaker and founder of Maison Noir Wines in Oregon, and a sommelier who has worked at some of the best restaurants in the country. Welcome, Andre. Hey, how's it going? Tonight is all about pairing wines and music. Our first concert of the year premieres this Friday night online. And our friends at Bangor Wine and Cheese Company have your wine selections all covered for your concert viewing. Um, we hope you leave tonight inspired to taste these wines and listen to this music. Eric, I'm going to turn it to you and Andre first, as I know we have a lot to cover at the start here, because we are pairing Andre's wines with this first BSO program. Why don't you kick things off? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, Andre, thank you for joining us. It's, it's a treat. Uh, as uh, people are probably going to pick up on, we, we were having some conversations prior to hitting the record button. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and Lucas kept stopping us because there's so many tidbits, <laughs> which I think is 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 just marvelous. Um, but uh, I I have never met uh, Andre uh, until this point, and it's kind of a bummer that we're doing it over Zoom. But hey, that's that's cool. But I've I've been uh, an admirer uh, of his work uh, for for years, and so when um, I was asked to do this uh, tasting notes pairing thing, I, I love imaginative things and. Uh, as some of you may know, I was a classical singer prior to my career as a booze merchant, and uh, therefore I have uh, at least some insight. My, my professors at my various colleges might question how much insight I have as to the music side of it. But um, when I saw what Lucas had programmed for this first concert, um, <clears throat> I got some really cool ideas. And one of the, the ideas that I really, uh, the first thing that popped into my mind was that um, the symphony is doing a piece by Florence Price, and Florence Price was, and I'm sure a lot of you don't know uh, her, and I hope that changes uh, as, of, as of this week. Um, she was uh, one of America's first really uh, wonderful black female composers at a time when it wasn't real easy to be either a black composer or a female composer, and she was in the Jim Crow set. Eventually, she made her way up to Chicago and found some uh, champions that uh, brought her music to the fore, which uh, I'm very thankful for. And we're going to talk to Andre about all that, but uh, there's so much to talk to Andre about, um, including an unexpected musical tie-in in his family. <laughs> um, but, uh, for, I mean, for the, you'll all realize Andre's a, a character. He's a personality. He, he has many, many hats, including the gray one he's wearing now. Um, I got to know him through his wine, but he does all, I'll let him get to it. I'm just going to start that. <laughs> um, Let's but, do it. All right. So the first thing is going to be something that I didn't include necessarily on that, that cheat sheet that I sent you. Uh, I was doing some reading and I happened upon the fact that you have, uh, three sons and you're a, you're a hardworking dad. Cool. Oh, well, it's an old article. Yeah, it's an old article. Okay, so you're a hardworking dad, and <laughs> yeah. I was reading about, you know, your homeschooling your kids, of course, mm -hmm. um, and giving them a well-rounded education, and I was kind of curious, when did, when did you, age-wise and maybe place-wise, start to realize that you cared about what you put in your mouth, near your nose, that these things were not only important, but kind of crucial? Um. 25, 27, you know, it happened, it happened later in life for me in, in that sense of like, you know, that all those things were important. I think, you know, obviously I was eating, I was putting things in my mouth, I was tasting stuff and, and had some sort of palate. Uh, maybe I didn't know my way around it uh, and, and probably didn't really understand or care that the things that I was putting in my body affected, it, you know, my life in that way. Um, but uh, you know, it, it happened later in life for me. I think for my kids, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Yeah. So we're on kid number four. So we have four boys, um, aging from I think we have somebody just turned. So we have twelve, uh, ten, and then we have a five. He turns five next week, 
and the other one just turned two. So we're, you know, we're in the mix and the gamut of it. And, um, you know, we were, you know, for, for me, I think homeschooling was less, I mean, everybody's homeschooling now, but like for, for me, you know, we've always had this thing and the saying that, you know, never let school get in the way of your education. And, you know, I always talk about, you know, the greatest gifts that I feel like that I could give my children uh, is the gift of language and the gift of travel. Um, and, you know, those two things, I think will take them very far in, in life. Um, I'd have to say that they probably are more aware of the things that they put in their body and, and drink and taste than, than I am, uh, than I ever was. But um, it, it didn't happen for me at an early age, I, I guess in the way that like, that I would could consider would lead me down the path that I am now, I think. But, you know, I mean, I was a kid, I ate stuff, I, I did stuff and, you know, I'm, I'm sure those experiences reflective in my palate today and, 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 and how I'm a taster and stuff like that. But, but in hindsight, there wasn't any kind of training or anything or any way that I could link the two together. You know, I ate cheeseburgers a lot, you know? Yeah, cool. Um, any of your kids got a good palate? Yeah, you know, I think they all go through the stages, right? You know, um, you know, at each age, one is always the official taster. So anytime wine is open in the house, you know, there's one, you know, right now it's, it's you know, they're all numbers, right? I call them all junior, right? Just so like everybody snaps to attention. It's like junior, they're like, you talking to me, Pop? No, I'm talking to you. Yeah. So like, but the idea, um, you know, number number three, you know, pickle is is the official taster. Anytime any wine is open in the house, you know, he goes through the ritual of, the, of tasting it to make sure that it's sound. And it's kind of been passed down through that. But, you know, I think that, you know, they're all different. And they, it's so funny that, like, that you're like, wait a minute, you guys grew up in the same house eating the same stuff. But, you know, one, the oldest one doesn't really eat meat. Uh, you know, you know, the, number three is like, if there's no meat, then it's really not dinner, you know, so it's, it, you know, it just really fluctuates. Uh, and, you know, obviously they have, you know, really interesting tastes and things that they crave because, you know, there's been so many things put in front of them for sure, you know. Um, switching topics. Uh, something yeah. I've been fascinated with about you is that you, well, as I wrote it here, you work in Oregon, but seem to have fever dreams of Burgundy. Mm -hmm. uh, you you take traditional French isms and both revere them and turn them on their head. Uh, when when did the ideas for that start? Was that always sort of your view of wine, or did it take being ensconced in the serious world of wine with Thomas mm -hmm. and Butler, et cetera, to realize a lot of this is kind of ridiculous? Well, I think both, right? I, I think it was just my outlook on life in general. And I just, it's who I was as a person before wine entered my life. And as I started to transition into that world, I, I feel like you, you know, in, you have to master those rules and that, and play by those games rules in order to be able to change them. And for me, it, at the beginning, it was really about like, oh, hey, this is, I'm, I'm studious, I'm learning everything about it. But like in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking like, yeah, this is kind of silly, but this is the way they do it. And, you know, and I'm just looking at it and the parallels and, uh, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, that you see or that I came up with were just ways to help me remember those things, right? You know, um, Burgundy was always a first love of mine. Uh, and I think for many domestic Pinot Noir producers, you know, it is something that we aspire to make. We know that we can't, you know, it's a beacon of light of which we aspire to make, uh, you know, and not just not just those, not just, we know that we can never make that wine, but it's the care and take, you know, it's the whole thing, it, it, you know, that Burgundy puts out there that, you know, that we want to grasp and, and, um, and kind of convey in our wines. And so that's, that's everything. I mean, there's inspiration for all the wines that I make, right? You know, from, you know, from France, from, from mainly from France, actually, to be honest with you, now that I think about it. Well, uh, I, I identify a lot with you because my, my first gig, uh, we talked uh, before we, we signed on about how I was working for a company called Cool Vines and, and uh, you mm -hmm. were my old boss the other day, you were saying, and, uh, um, but before I worked there, I worked for another guy uh, in Princeton who was uh, uh, an absolute tremendous guy from, uh, from Burgundy, but well, mm -hmm. He says Burgundy, I tell him Beaujolais because it's from the village of Laissez, which is really on the border, but let's be Yeah, honest. absolutely, yep. Um, 
but he he you know having burgundy as my first sort of um learning uh tool uh really really helped me out mm -hmm. uh so what was the first like for folks who don't know like you're you're you know you 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 ref you reference hip-hop all the time uh opp other people's pino bo three and, and noir um, yep. uh, uh you know get fresh through all that sort of stuff um, I'm dating myself, but I think we're all <laughs> we can say that. Um, but uh, what was the first one? What was the first one where you're like, OPP, other people's kids? That's really funny. We're going to go with that. Um, I think, I think OPP, actually it was Pee Wee, which is, you know, less about wine. But like, you know, a lot of these things that actually have come to fruition were all jokes. And right. just me kind of like off the top of my head while I'm, you know, decanting, you know, 45 Mouton out of Magnum at per se, right? This was all a running joke. The logo that you see was a screensaver that I created that, you know, lived on my computer. You know, it was, the, it was always the one day and, you know, it would just spiral, you know, snowball. I'm like, oh, hey, you know, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to make a wine called Show Nuff. And, you know, it's my interpretation of Shout Enough to Pop. We're going to spell it with Nuff, like Nuff and Shout Enough. Like, you know what I mean? It was just, it was always playful and just fun and, that's kind of how it started to roll. But, you know, as I found myself, you know, being, you know, getting restless, you know, at, you know, I'm at the, one of the best jobs in the world for what I did. And, you know, and then you start to ask yourself, wow, like, is this what the rest of my life looks like? Right. You know what I mean? It's like, well, it can't be, I won't allow it to be. And, you know, where do you go from here? And, um, and, you know, at that moment, you know, I was like, I want to make wine, right? That, you know, that allows me to continue to um, to learn about wine if I make it, but also it scratched several other itches I had, you know, you know there we go. Um, one, uh, I really wanted to, you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so I knew I, I, I wanted to work for myself, but also I wanted to have more creativity in my life. And, you know, as a sommelier, I found that we're more akin to, um, to a curator at a museum. We just collect other people's stories and we put them there. I didn't get my hands there. You know, so, you know, that kind of scratched some other itches. And so I decided that, you know, I would, I would leave and, and, and go do something else. And, and that, you know, that really kind of changed everything. And then now you're like, so what do I do? What, you know, what do I call all of this? And, you know, I, I had it all right there in front of me. You know, I had been talking about it for years sure. and right. that were, that were jokes right. actually turned themselves into, to real life things, you know, Mouton, you know, the originally a company was called Mouton Noir. That was the logo. And we just, we just ran with everything. I'm surprised it's so tasteful to be honest, because uh, if I were to say some of the uh, joke names that me and my staff have had for certain wines, over the years, <laughs> a lot of trouble. Well, uh, well, you know, we, 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 we kind of waded through those and, and, and kind of threw some of those to the side, but we did, we did have fun. And, you know, music has, you know, was always been a part of my life. I mean, I think my parting gift from per se was uh, was noise counseling headphones from the Bose store, right? Nice. I, I, I think I was, they kind of saw me as weird because I always wore headphones, N not during service, but like right. when I'm like running around doing stuff and, you know, it was was really interesting. Like now everybody wears headphones, right? Like it's, you know, it's, it's just part of your wardrobe. But back then, like in 2004, they thought I was pretty strange. And, uh, but I was always listening to music and that's kind of always been my, been my thing. And um, it's just, it was just really funny that like, oh, you like music so much. They just thought it was strange. Everybody, you know, people walking around the street talking to themselves now, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's really interesting. I mean, people have strangely narrow views of of, 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 of other people. I mean, I remember even in high school getting asked, you play football? I thought you played cello. I'm like, I, I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do both? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'll get to Florence Price in a second, but I, this is something that I'd like uh, your answer on. Is there hope for the wine industry? And, and what do you think is the single greatest sin being committed in it now? Well, you know, that's, you know, that's a pretty interesting. I think there's hope for everything, right? Like, you know, it's the reason why we all get up. And, you know, the wine industry is interesting. And I think that, you know, it is, it, it has many different viewpoints. I, and I think, you know, 
we're all starting to realize that what the pretense and all those other things and those barriers have started to be started to, to kind of break down. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just not what we all thought it would be. And, um, and so I think they're, they're starting to rectify that. And, and also I think, you know, some of the bigger companies are starting to realize that like, Oh, they're trying to market to, to younger people and, 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 but people are finding their place, right? They're not, they're not waiting for the overall uh, industry to create something for them. People are getting involved, getting in the industry and creating what they would like to see. Uh, and you, you, you see that all across the board. Uh, and the same thing, you know, not, you know, I was talking to someone earlier today, natural wine, like we drink the same wines, they just weren't called natural. But now that they have a name and a title that, you know, that's something that that's attractive to, to, to young people to be a part of something and to create their own thing within that. And I think that's what you're really seeing in the wine business. And I think like when we say the, you know, the industry, you know, it's just not one viewpoint anymore, right? There's many different ways for, for people to be, you know, in it. Um, and I guess the biggest crime, I, and I don't even know, like there's, it seems like there's so much other shit, but like for me, I just, yeah, I felt like I've just created my own, you just create your own world within it. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think that we're, we're going to look back and say, oh, wow, like this is where some of it kind of went wrong or went this way. Um, I, don't, I, I, don't, I can't even tell you what, what okay. the biggest crime is. Yeah. Um, something I, I'm kind of thinking of is, you know, one of the struggles that I would say classical music has is the same as, as the wine industry has or had. And that's mm -hmm. the thing is the wine industry is sort of being reformed by people like yourself who say, well, this is what I want to see out of it. This is what I want to get out of it. This is what I want to give to people out of it. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, I know that this is a, that's been a, a job of, of Lucas's in terms of programming as well, yeah. as, as trying to diversify and, 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 you know, let people find their way in uh, because not everybody's way in is going to be the same. Uh, Correct, and I think, and I think, I, and I think that is, is that the wine industry as a whole just being more welcoming in that way. But like, the, I, you know, my I think for me, you know, I'm different because I just I I got into this industry because I wanted to be around people who were into wine, right? And, you know that you know that that was my thing. And I think for a lot of the the people that break barriers and those things, it's their love of that thing. Right. that they're willing to endure whatever that is just to be a part of that thing. Um, and, and you know, you know, for me, it took a, a while for me to understand that, you know, because I've done that, there's a lot of people who look like me, feel like that they can be a part of it too, because now they finally see somebody who looks like them, um, which I didn't understand how powerful it was, you know, to be honest, when I was in my early 20s, right? Like, and that, that's, that's a real thing, you know, when you, when you don't see people that look like you doing something that you want to do, uh, you know, you, you tend to think that it may not be for you. So. Well, actually that leads me back to the kids thing. I think, you know, nothing has shown me the, the truth of what, what you just said more than for instance, uh, the recent inauguration watching my daughter uh, watch a, a female vice president yeah. uh, get sworn in things like that. I mean, it's, it's a profound thing to watch kids and then yeah maybe we lose sight of it a little bit but then we get back to the, the truth of it um so absolutely Florence Price uh speaking of <laughs> being black and female uh, yeah, yeah barriers um she didn't get her champions until later in life um mm -hmm. spent a lot of time in, in Jim Crow South getting turned down um when all she really wanted to do as you say was pursue her love of, of the thing yeah uh, who would you say are some of the champions you've found? And, uh, and what, what did they do for you? Uh, you know, I mean, that's a lot of people. It's so funny, right? You talk about, oh, you know, I did this on my own. I'm self-made. And that, that's not really true, right? You know, like there, there were many people, you know, who, who risked their job. And it's, it's so funny on many different levels, right? Um, you know, we talked about a colleague, you know, who became a dear friend that you used to work with, uh, who really one day, you know, put his job on the line because if his boss found out that I was riding around with him, he wanted to, he believed in what I was doing so much that he was willing to put his job on the line because he wanted to take me around to meet these great people that he thought I should meet. 
Um, you know, it's always little things like that, that you, that you see um, that you're like, wow, like that really meant a lot. You believe in this thing. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, some days you feel like, oh, well, it's only me that believes in it. There's tons of different people. I wouldn't be here. You know, I wrote an email to everybody I had ever worked with, you know, saying that I was leaving the restaurant business and going to make wine and, you know, not really having a plan, you know, in my mind, nor the resources, nor the money, none of that. Um, and people responded and reached out and, you know, offered many different things. You know, the, the reason why I'm sitting here in front of you is because of the good graces of other people. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I can't, I cannot answer that question and not say, well, my wife is a big champion of, of, of me and, and what I do and, and, you know, really giving me the confidence uh, and the space to, 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 to really build that, right. To go out and do that. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of different people along the way, you know, um, Mac McDonald, you know, was, you know, uh, a California vintner, um, was really the first person that, you know, that it dawned on me that like, oh, there's people who look like me who actually make wine. Uh, and that was, you know, that was a, a pivotal moment. And I, you know, I talked to him a lot on the phone, but when I moved to California to work at the French Laundry, you know, I, it was the first time I got a chance to meet him. And, you know, that was always been something. And, you know, to, to have his guidance and to have him talk to me and, you know, on a weekly basis, it was, you know, really helped. But it's, there's tons of people in that, you know, from, you know, Paul Roberts who hired me, you know, and believed in me and took me to, you know, to Napa Valley. So there's, a, there's been a lot of different people that have been champions on, on many different phases of what I've done and, and over my career, um, you know, from being a sommelier to kind of moving, you know, on the production side, building, um, you know, Maison Noir wines over the last 13 years um, to, you know, to now moving back into restaurants and hospitality and, and you know, doing really fun things. Yeah. So it's not just one name. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a community of people that have, have, that really have believed in me, uh, even on the days that I didn't, right? So. Right, yeah, boy, I yeah. Um, are, are you finding any pleasure in maybe nurturing other people's careers along and being a champion as well? No, totally, you know, it's been, it's been really interesting, you know, that part of it, right? You know, um, you know, there's thousands of emails a month, you know, of people reaching out and, you know, wanting to navigate the space and, um, you know, and just talking and talking to them through that, me sharing, you know, shortcuts or things or my opinions and those kind of things and, and kind of pushing them along and encouraging them saying, hey, like, you know, you, you can do this. And, you know, this is, this is where I see it now. And maybe there's an opportunity for you there. But yeah, no, totally. It, you know, it was one of the biggest ways that I, I felt like that I could give back and trying to carve out, you know, some time you know, I think it's, you know, it's like six hours, six hours a month or something like that, you know, just really trying to be able to get back. I always say yes. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty booked these days, you yeah. know, that's fantastic. Um, no, nah, it's been great. That's nice. It's uh, been really great. You are busy, so I don't want to keep you too long. Would you be kind enough to maybe talk uh, our viewers through the, the three wines that they're going to be yeah, sure. tasting? So um, for folks uh, at home, we have uh, is not on wood shard, is love drunk rosé, and his horseshoes and hand grenades red blend. Uh, all three of which are, are tremendously good, as are his other wines, um, which uh, <laughs> you see here, except my distributors out of them. So we'll don't yeah. get more. <laughs> Sounds great. But, you know, uh, yeah. um, you know, I've always worked in uh, chef driven restaurants. You know, so this you know was always about the food, and wine was there to make the food taste better, and so. For me, when I set out, you know, a lot of, you know, my things that, you know, philosophy about wine and things were built in a restaurant and they've really kind of carried over into my winemaking philosophy. We try to do as less as possible to the wine. You know, so for me, it's just, you know, it's, it's less about do, trying to figure out how to do less and less each year. We don't, the wines aren't jacked up on oak. Um, they're not hot. We pick early, you know, the common thread through all the wines is acid, right? Um, acid is, you know, um, you know, it's, um, it's an amplifier. It, you know, it, you know, you put, you know, the reason why you put salt on food, lemon on seafood is to really crank up the flavors of a dish and, and wine should work in that way. Uh, and so, you know, there's definitely acid in all the wines. Uh, first up is knock on wood, which is um, 
it's it, you know there probably should be a common there it's a knock on wood uh, so there is no uh, no oak in the wine it's all stainless steel uh, we use batonage instead of um, mallow to kind of give the wine a little bit more texture and grip uh, so think more Mekong here in France you know aged in big oak barrels no oak all stainless steel uh, but you get like this clean version of Chardonnay you know apples and pears um, you know, slightly floral white flowers, just really beautiful and, and, and great acidity. That's fantastic. I love, by the way, I've been saying that to people for years that, and I, I read a quote of yours somewhere, I hope it was an actual quote, but the wine is a condiment. It's, mm -hmm. it, and I tell people when I fell in love with wine and food is when I was singing in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the thing that occurred to me was like, at every table, wine was there. It wasn't yep. Bordeaux if I was in the middle of Umbria. It was the yeah, whole yeah, yeah. Well, but it was mm -hmm. delightful. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, no, that's, it was, it's such a succinct point. It's wine. It is, you know, it's, and it's funny, right? It's like, um, you know, wine is meant to be on your table next to salt and pepper shaker. If you look at the European table, that's the table is set, right? There's wine there, right? And it doesn't matter where it comes from. Like if there's, you know, if they're celebrating, like something great happened, maybe Barolo, but like, but the idea that, that every table has wine on it, that's part of the meal. Um, I think, you know, as Americans, we don't really have that kind of mentality or not yet. And, uh, and that's kind of how I try to explain it in the way that we make wines. And we're not, you know, I'm not making wines, uh, you know, that are the centerpiece of your table that should be worship. It's, it's about everyday luxury. It's supposed to make everything that you do better from listening to music, symphony, to, you know, reading a book with friends, to, um, um, you know, having conversations, parties, those kind of gatherings, um, it sets the tone. It, it shouldn't be the thing, right? right. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of been our style that, we, that, we've, that we've taken over the years. Um, and so you can definitely see that in Knock on Wood. Um, Long Drunk is, um, we started making that wine in 2007. That's our rosé. Uh, it's pretty unique in the fact that it is mainly white wine. So it's, you know, it's mainly Chardonnay. Uh, blended with about 23% Pinot Noir. So everything is made separately, so vinified separately, uh, and then blended together, right? So um, so it's that that idea that, you know, that, you know, it's Chardonnay gives the wine, it's this the structure, uh, and then you get like these berry notes and those kind of things and acidity from the Pinot Noir that we, that we blend into it. But um, this has all been great. This is, uh, I think this is the current release. I don't know what you guys have. Uh, uh, I think we have 19. We're waiting on yep. this one. But it's drinking beautiful, which, which is which is great, right? And like you know, I always tell people, um, you know, it's you know, rosés are made differently, and that whole idea that it is that it should be consumed and within the you know, the, the, you know, in a season or something like that is not necessarily true, especially in something in a wine like this where we're actually talking about it is mainly Chardonnay. You know, it's a premium grape. It's not a, it's not runoff of something that would not normally go into the wine that they really make. Absolutely. Uh, but we could talk about that a little bit more. But this has always been great. Strawberry, kiwi, yeah. um, just, you know, very, very floral on the nose. Great acid. I mean, this, you know, I've always, you know, I've always been in love with this wine. You know, this is, this wine was an ode to my restaurant career, right? You know, it was like, I was, you know, it, it gave me so much. I fell in love with it, but I was breaking up because I was leaving, you know, I was going on to, to bigger and better things. But now I'm, I'm back. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and we're, you know, uh, so, uh, before we get to that, so folks, after Andre, uh, leaves to do his million other things, uh, <laughs> a little bit about what he's talking about, because this is where the musical tie-in comes, is that when you're trying to pair things, people always ask, how do you pair wine? And I, I compare it a lot to music, and we're going to be talking about counterpoint, harmony, dissonance, what is nice to hear and taste versus, oh, that's, not quite. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but just to, to, to preview that. So horseshoes and hand grenades, hit us. Yes, horseshoes and hand grenades. Um, you know, this is, um, to me, this is a celebration of the most creative part of the winemaking process, uh, which is the art of blending, right? Uh, this wine is mainly Syrah from, um, from Oregon, from Del Rio down south, blended with Washington State Cab and Merlot. So almost equal parts, about 19, 18% Cab and Merlot. Uh, with about 68% of Syrah. So Syrah gives the, the wine its structure, its body. Um, you know, Merlot gives it this fruitiness and Cabernet gives, you know, some graphite uh, and fruit. You know, so it, to me, it's always just been like this, 
this fun thing, but like horseshoes and hand grenades, my parents were officers in the military and, you know, it was always, you know, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. And I had started another company called Code Noir, uh, which I had, you know, I had to fold after three years of it being open. And we still kept the same Merlot contract that we have. Um, and eventually it grew into this, this wine, which is called, you know, horseshoes and hand grenades, which, um, you know, it's so funny, you know, it started out as just a wine that we gave, you know, our family members as part of their holiday allocation. Right. Uh, it was, you know, and, and probably illegally, right? Because I don't think it had, they had labels. We were just shipping it to them, you know, just like here, just like have it, you know, I had it. And the more that, you know, I saw it in the warehouse, you know, the more guilty I felt that, you know, I didn't actually make any money off of it. So, so we were just shipping it to them. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, a year and a half later, I had made my way back you know, to a relative's house or something like that. And, you know, getting ready to have dinner and they open up this wine. And I was like, oh, wow, like, okay, like, this is, this is pretty good. Uh, and that was, uh, I think that was like around 2009, 2010, we officially released to the public and we've been making the wine ever since. Um, the idea to me is, you know, all the wines, you know, we talk about accessibility and that means that the wines are, are pleasurable to drink right away. Uh, in that sense, and I feel like we did a really good job with balance here in the sense that it's not too alcoholic, you know, nothing, everything seems to be in balance, alcohol, uh, fruit, uh, acid. Uh, but uh, it, this, the red wine is, is pretty remarkable. I, like, you know, every now and then I have to check the price to see if I make, make any money because, it, you know, it's such a value. It's really great. It does drink up, as it were. Yeah, for real. It, uh, it it's, does. It's, been a, it's a, been a real constant around here. Um well, I, I'm going. I'm going to thank you and let you go because you have four, four <laughs> and uh, and a very tolerant wife <laughs> who lets you play. Yeah. That's no, very. No, um, she's great. And uh, I, I hope that uh, we can find time again to uh, talk with you. Uh, the wines are fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And uh, no worries. Golly, you know, uh, it's been a treat. Thank you. I appreciate it. All righty. It's so nice to hear from you, Andre. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Louis, Lucas. All righty. Um, yeah, feel free to sign off. We're, we're, we're not good at uh, doing this seamlessly. So. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Hold on. Oh, he's gone. All right. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Eric, you got to tell me, because I, I was generating ideas as Andre was talking. How did you envision each, which piece did which wine uh, match up to in your head? Right, so it wasn't so much that the wines were per, per the piece. The, 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 the wine element really came from the breaking of the color barrier reference to Florence Price, uh, as well as breaking into a, a white dominated world with a lot of conventions, a lot of silly conventions in some cases, and a lot of conventions that are absolutely on purpose for real for a reason and i i just love the idea of of his his determination to to be his own person while incorporating a lot of the uh dimensions of of classical european winemaking well you take that with florence price i mean her music is not inaccessible it's not like she was writing anything that's that's crazy it was all very very based in tonality it was it's beautiful. It's it's stirring. She's playing by the rules, as as it were, just like Andre was saying. But she couldn't get anywhere, you know, because of it. Um, and I, I just found it uh, like he was the guy I wanted to talk to to sort of uh, understand the bravery that it kind of takes to break into that sort of world. Uh, well, the the parallel that you um, drew between. Uh, wine and music is fascinating to me. Um, I hadn't really thought about the um, levels of appreciation for both wine and music and, and the uh, certain el elitism that is um, part of uh, it, uh, uh, an unfortunate part of both worlds. Um, but at the same time, um, there are many, many wine lovers who just love wine for wine's sake and many music lovers who just love music for music's sake without needing or wanting to know much about it. Right. <laughs> you know, 
thing about it, and this is, I guess, maybe one of the sadder statements about the fact that we're talking about a woman who was never recognized in her time because of the fact that she was Black and a woman, uh, is that wine and music can be ennobling, right? They can give you a sense of, of wonder and pride and 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 let's be honest, uh, sometimes you step into a concert hall and you just, you feel good. You feel, dare I say, important. Not because it's you that you're there, that people are there to see, but that you have decided to go and see a performance of great music or, or whatever. Same going with, you know, stepping into an art gallery. Same, I think, stepping into a fine wine shop is that you've chosen to ennoble yourself by indulging but from there you don't have to take it super seriously all you have to do is take the initial step into the world and say i kind of like this yeah and uh and i think that's tremendous i think that's why i slipped so easily from one world into the other is because it's a joy to perform uh papageno as much as it is a joy to have you know people come back and tell me the, the wine you recommended for my anniversary was wonderful. We haven't had such a great time since we were in, you know, Verona. Um, it's a very, very similar sort of sensation. Yeah, and I think uh, Andre said two things that brought me to music right away. One, I was thinking of Florence Price in particular was this, you know, you, you fall in love with something because you fall in love with it. It's, it's just your thing. And and you, it's sort of inexplicable as to how you got there. And you, you can see that in Florence Price's career. She just had this love for doing the thing. And she did it at the radio station. She did it in the school. She did it with her private piano studio. She was writing songs and arrangements for popular music alongside these symphonies. And uh, you, you just do it because you love it and for the love of the craft. No one would publish it otherwise. I mean, yeah. that's fascinating. I mean, you know, tremendous woman. And, you know, my father is a, a longtime classical music lover, which I'm sure helped him still my love of it. And uh, he had not heard of her uh, until, I guess, two years ago, but I, I did uh, talk to him recently. And, uh, and and he was so delighted that, uh, that we're doing this as well, because it's really, it's music that needs to be heard. Uh, and now the, it's the right time. It's such a, it's so the right time. So it's almost a delightful accident that COVID happened and Lucas had to sort of <laughs> re, re judge everything. But uh, I'm super glad that the people are going to get to hear her work and hopefully uh, seek out more of her stuff. Um, and then the other thing uh, that he mentioned that I will sort of lead us into the second part of this and, and, and then we'll let all of you uh, sufferers go is that the other part of my inspiration for all this is exactly what Andre and I were talking about at the end there, which is complementary pieces, right? So in the tasting kit that we're, we have, um, we have complementary pieces. We have manchego cheese, we have petit toast, we have marcona almonds, we have, but then we also have a cornichon, which is a little gherkin pickle, right? For anybody who doesn't know. And so the concept of this is as you're tasting the wine, whichever wine you pick or whichever wines, and you're having the delight of the rosé with the manchego, harmony. But then you throw in a little, a little dissonance, the cornichon maybe, um, with a fig spread and see what you think. Because that to me is very much how I think about it. And it's very much how I entered college as a composer. I didn't leave college as a composer because my voice was far better than my composition. But the point is, it's exactly the same sort of idea. So, uh, Lucas, maybe you can talk a little bit about the idea of what counterpoint is and how it relates to the other two composers specifically that uh, we're going to be talking to. Talking well, um, music is a language. So if we start from there, when somebody says, makes a, says a sentence, um, we generally follow the train of thought. Uh, if another voice comes in and uh, you respond, there's an answer, or sometimes that answer could happen simultaneously before the first person has finished their statement. 
Um, in actual counterpoint in music, very often the, the material is, um, it might be the same statement that's placed on top uh, and, and, and uh, just put to the side. Um, and then once this person says this, and this person basically says the same thing, this person goes on to something else while this person is still saying the same, the, the first uh, idea. Now imagine not just two voices, but imagine four voices uh, to have this uh, texture of all these notes that are going which way and, and sideways and up and down. Um, and at the same time, making sense in a harmonic way. So there are, there are these, these moments in time when these notes keep on corresponding to chords, chord progressions as we move uh, forward. Um, it is a remarkable kind of thing. You know, so often we, we, like when you go to a musical theater show, you'll hear a song and one person sings one melody and then there's an accompaniment. It might be um chup, um chup, or um chup, chup, um chup. Well, somebody like Verdi, everything's um chup, chup, um chup. <laughs> So <laughs> the, the melody goes on top of that. But with Bach and the Baroque composers, they um, were one of the driving things for them uh, was the sense of multiple conversations in music, this counterpoint um, that um, uh, made the whole idea so much richer because it wasn't just an accompaniment and a melody, which interestingly la later after the Baroque period, that's what the classical period um, became, uh, uh, a kind of dumbing down in a way of that complexity of that Baroque ideal the gilded everything was very complicated but at the same time uh, it, very elaborate uh, and beautiful hmm. so that's that's exactly that's exactly how i feel about what what it is that i do it's 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 the taking of of the notes it's understanding that one of those notes is going to continue longer than the other uh and uh, and occasionally wanting to throw in playfulness Mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, that's that's ultimately what what we what we are going to be doing with this tasting kit. So for folks at home, uh, it'll it'll all come together, and I will have a sheet sort of explaining what I'm saying now. Um, but basically, that's that's the plot. Is that I took the idea, and also uh, Bloch's piece has uh, this fugue uh, uh, fugal idea, and and also heavy use of this. And so that I figured that was where I was going to go because the other. The other way I could have gone, folks, is that Bloch really celebrates his Jewish heritage, and I don't think anybody wanted to be drinking Manischewitz, right? So let's go with the counterpoint. Yeah? Okay. Just so we're all on the same page. Um, so to be careful, to clarify, we're talking about two different composers. There's Johann Sebastian Bach, Bach, B-A-C-H, and Ernst Bloch, B-L-O-C-H. Yeah. Um, Perhaps uh, Switzerland's most famous composer. Yes, and Bloch um, wrote this piece that we're, uh, we, we do with uh, Spencer Meyer at, um, on piano, uh, playing piano obligato, concerto grosso number one with, uh, with strings and, and piano obligato. Um, uh, it, it was written a actually in deference to, uh, in, as, a, as a celebration of uh, Baroque techniques, but, but the idea of being able to take the techniques from um, the past and bring them into a more modern medium. So you can still have a fugue, um, at the, all this counterpoint, but not necessarily um, with all the Baroque trappings, more um, a, a more modern sensibility in terms of harmony and that, and that sort of thing. Well, doesn't that sound like drinking wine from a guy named Andre Mack and having some Manchego and Marcona almonds? And mm. I, for those who, who do want to line up the wines with the music, I, I, my wheels have been spinning and I'm going to propose, uh, and you can, Eric, you can tell me if this is uh, sacrilege, this order. So the, the program order, we open with the Bloch Concerto Grosso, then we go to the Florence Price on Dante Moderato, and we conclude with the Bach uh, Concerto uh, Number 1 D minor. And I, I am feeling the rosé for the Bloch Concerto Grosso. I, I feel this, this blend of the, the, the dark and the light and the, the mixing of styles to create something 
totally delightful on its own. And there's a there's a there's a heaviness uh, also that that uh, um, is it, you know is is clearly in a little more a little more intense in in this. Um, um, yeah, fair enough. And then the I I was feeling the Florence Price for the knock on wood for the for the white just the the fruity notes the sort of crispness this breath of fresh air. And and then the the weight of the Bach that we conclude with does have the way Andre was describing describing uh, his his process with with the red there. Really oh really oh I I, I misunderstood I misunderstood you misunderstood my this my, is my, this is Bach this is the Bach in, in my oh. mind. I think Eric has left the door open for those wanting to to uh, mix and match their own uh, wine and music pairing and. It's a really awesome kit. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, we have we have super subscribers who, in addition to purchasing this kit, you can get 15% off um, any additional of Andre's wines that you want to uh, pursue with your tasting kit as well, which is awesome. Thank you, Banger Wine and Cheese Company. And really, the, the big news is that this concert, our first digital concert of the season, premieres this Friday night, and we're really thrilled to share it with you all. And uh, we have a conversation uh, with with Spencer and you, Brian, and and uh, and, and me uh, about the music a little more uh, intensely. So there's a it, it's nice to have this kind of fully rounded uh, opportunity to experience um, the music, the history, and also to uh, um, stimulate other senses that go along uh, with with an appreciation of this music. So thank you for this, this uh, um, adding to our palette, Eric. It's, uh, very much appreciate it. Happy to do it. Happy to support the symphony uh, as always. And uh, wanted to thank you both for inviting me to, to do this rather unique twist on, on supporting the symphony. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as anyone out there uh, knows, uh, who knows these two gentlemen, uh, we're all, we're, we're a great community here in Bangor and we all, uh, our friends and, and and without each other's support, Bangor would not be what it is. So uh, you guys keep doing what you do and uh, thank you very much. And thank you to all folks who are watching this and supporting uh, both us and the symphony. We'll see you in the store. Please do give us 24 hours notice uh, for the order of a tasting kit because frankly, uh, we're quite delighted that the demand has been fairly heavy. So, uh, uh, do get us uh, in touch with us. You can order it online on our online store or simply call us if you like that. That's uh, easier uh, for you, whatever works for you. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you all and you two gentlemen uh, at our next Tasting Notes video. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Good night. <laughs>